Hello everybody, I'm super excited to be getting ready to cut the length of pole and put the recoil pad on this project. I'm excited because it's the last of only a couple more dangerous operations that could potentially ruin the whole project. I just love getting down to the point where we're just sanding and oiling and all the fears behind us. But of course, we would never screw up that bad, right? And uh, so, I just want to run through with you all what it is I do to accomplish this task. So first uh, tool is this guy. I turned this on the lathe out of a chunk of steel, but uh, I'm sure an enterprising person can come up with something creative that will accomplish the same thing. It sits flat on the workbench and slides up um, to the, the curved part of the trigger. Gives me something to measure from. Because, while well, what we're really doing with length of pull is we're setting eye relief, the distance from the shoulder to where the beginning of the focus of the optic is. But the datum we use to measure that is from the trigger to the back of the gun stock. And, of course, a, a common way of checking that fit is to hold the pistol grip in your hand with your finger on the trigger and uh, your arm bent at 90 degrees, <clears throat> and then that dimension from your trigger finger to the bicep would be what we're looking for. Uh, but I have an article on my website that describes a bunch of other ways of considering um, how to judge the length of pool. Uh, what season is the gun going to be used in? If you're in snow country all bundled up with a really thick jacket then maybe it's going to be a shorter length of pull uh, depending on the shooting position. If it's a field target you're going to shoot in the pretzel sitting position that might be a different length of pull than offhand etc etc. In any case <clears throat> this client knows his length of pull 14 to 5 8 inches so <clears throat> masking tape rubbed well into the wood really rub it in uh, to help prevent any little tiny splintering not that it matters a whole lot because we're going to be sanding significantly on the belt sander to shape the recoil pad and we're going to shape the pad and the wood together but still why risk it it also gives us a nice place to draw the uh, cut line on I use a long straight edge laid along the top edge of the forearm because it's very uh, easy it's very easy optical illusion to lay your measuring stick down here thinking you're straight and you're off at a crazy angle and then that can give you an error of dimension so straight edge and then the measuring tool the recoil pad that we're going to use is a half inch thick so 14 and 5 eighths is what we want to finish at, so we're going to mark, make our mark at 14 and an eighth inches. Let me just stick my head in here, because I keep double quadruple checking. Yep, that's exactly what we got. A little pencil mark there. A uh, trick with the masking tape, old masking tapes gets really sticky and hard to get off of the um, roll. Uh, you can nuke it in the microwave for 10 or 15 seconds. That'll soften up the whole roll. Or I just put the heat gun on it a little bit uh, so that the tape comes off without tearing every two inches. Uh, okay, so make the mark. Then we'll take the action out of the wood. Oh, I use a little shim underneath so that it's uh, not tilted crazy on the bench. So I got a little shim underneath there so it's square when I'm working on it. So let me get that out of the way. Take the action out. It's glass bedded so it's a perfect fit. So then, put this on the table like that. Let me scoot it down here so you can see better. A uh, weight to hold it like that. Now, if the um, if the comb, if it's a gun stock like a Monte Carlo or something, has a comb, if the comb is higher than the top of the forearm, and that's exactly what we see on pre-charged pneumatic guns, where the trigger hangs off the bottom of the air tube instead of off the bottom of the breech block. And few PCB guns are situated where the trigger is off the bottom of the breech block. Almost all of them is off the bottom of the air tube. And what that does is it pushes your sight plane up higher than a normal gun by the height of the air tube and that also means the comb is that same height higher than a quote normal gun whatever that means you know what we're traditionally accustomed to from the firearm world I guess is what I mean by normal so in the case where the comb is 
taller than the top of the forearm, then you need to put something down on top of the table to raise the forearm up, otherwise the uh, comb, right, is not going to be laying flat on the table. I think you get the picture. All right, so now we need to draw a line here, a perpendicular line. Well, I like to cut my length, of, I like to cut my butt stocks 90 degrees to the forearm. But you'll see, if you review guns in your own safe and look at pictures online, you'll see that there's a variety of angles that it can be cut on. So you can choose your own angle for your project, but uh, nearly everything I do, I, I cut them at 90 degrees. So I use a sheet of uh, cardstock, 8.5 by 11 cardstock, as a, uh, as a perpendicular because it's flexible. Uh, certainly I have plastic and steel triangles, you know, for 90 degree and 30 out 60, and that's what I like to call those, and 45 degree. Um, but th because they're stiff, you can't conform to the curved shape of the stock, and it's kind of difficult to judge as you're drawing the line, you know, what's going on. But with a piece of paper, uh, cardstock paper, nice and thick, you can lay that right along the curve and, and get that line drawn. <clears throat> So next, we're going to take it over to the compound sliding miter saw, get this jigged up, use the laser feature to help us judge where it's going to go, and uh, make that cut. Now it doesn't really matter. You see how this uh, cutout is burned? This is from pausing with the blade. So the trick to not have any burn, and you don't want to just go into this whole chunk of wood all at once with the blade and then try to cut and cause all that force. Because when you do that, what if this thing shifted a little bit? This is the final, final cut. There's no going back. So I like to do multiple gentle passes back and forth, going deeper and deeper each time. And the trick to avoid burning, which like I said doesn't matter, it's going to be covered up. But why do less than perfect if you're capable of perfection? But the trick to that is to don't stop moving. Just stay in constant motion, nice gentle passes back and forth until it's all the way through. And then after the cut, I flex the blade uh, slightly away from the cut because there's a little bit of play in the thing. It's not, I wouldn't call it play, there's just some flexibility. Uh, any saw is going to have that. And, just pull it away from the cut a little bit and wait for the blade to spin down. Nice thing about the Makita compound sliding miter saw that I use is it's got electric brake. So when you let go of the trigger, it stops pretty quick. But still, I, I move it away and wait for it to spin down before doing anything else. So I'm going to go ahead and get uh, set up on the saw and I will turn the camera back on when I'm ready to make the cut. Okay, so here we are set up on the compound sliding miter saw. A couple of notes. Use a piece of aluminum uh, channel here uh, to basically it's an extender for this small fence. I, I'm not sure you call that a fence because it's 90 degrees to what a fence would be. But anyway, extends this out so I can get the forearm um, square to this. Not strictly speaking necessary, I suppose, but uh, it's a best practice, I think, to do that. And then I've got some shims here to uh, take up the little gap that ends up resulting. And this is on here and tightened down. But this is why I was saying light passes, because this is all kind of a little sketchy. It's firm, but it's not the kind of thing I would want to bury the saw into the wood and just go... Rawr! right through it. I'm going to take gentle passes. Uh, I bet a lot of you out there probably think it's not wise to put a hand anywhere near a spinning blade, but I'm probably going to help hold this just because not, I'm not really holding it, but I can feel if anything's shifting or moving around. It seems silly. I just want to really uh, keep a close eye on it. <clears throat> so Yep, I feel confident that we're ready to go. So I'm going to turn the vacuum on and then the saw, so be prepared with your volume control.
call perfection. That's the way we like to do it. No burn marks. See, just like I said. Beautiful square cut. No splintering around the edges. It's perfect. Okay, so next we're going to get set up for uh, drilling the holes for the recoil pad, and I'll check back in with you in a bit. Okay, so here we are getting ready to drill the holes for the recoil pad. I want to go over a few things that I do. So, first off, is note that uh, whatever the dimension between the holes are in the recoil pad that you choose to use, um, this particular brand that I usually use is kind of an unusual size, 3 and 1 16th inch. I don't know, did they mean them to be 3 inch, but the tooling got set up at 3 and a 16th? Uh, they're all 3 and a 16th that I get from them, so just check your own. And while you can eyeball center to center to the hole, if you measure from like the left edge to the left edge, that, that's the same thing and it gives you a, a very clear datum to be measuring to instead of trying to judge the middle of the hole. But it, it hardly really matters. I mean, I think I probably overthink most things that I do. So I, the recoil pad is rarely going to be uh, the same size as what your stock is. And in this case, the stock at this point, which is not finished being shaped, is larger than the recoil pad. And the top of my uh, butt stock here is pretty close to being done. And I would rather not have to remove more material in order to accommodate the pad from this, which is important for our face placement and our cheek placement, so for looking through the optic. So I don't want to lose my drop here, and I don't care about how much material I have to remove off the bottom. So I align the, the top of the recoil pad. Now some of the pad needs to be removed in order to expose its uh, plastic part underneath, but this particular molding is pretty close. Anyway, I'm lining this up flush with the top of the stock. Whoop, let me make sure you see here. And then I'm poking a hole through here. Oh, hold on. I left off a step. So I, I have a line drawn on here. The way I got that line is by measuring the center uh, left to right, identify the middle, in a number of different locations because this is always going to be a rough shape at this point it's not perfectly symmetrical it's not going to be something you can really use as a datum to judge like the middle of the top to the middle of the bottom that's not going to work so I, I find the center in a whole bunch of different places and then get the average of those to draw the line then I put the forearm uh, you know, put the gun stock upside down on the workbench and check that that seems square. Now, when you're doing that, the forearm is rarely equal on both sides. One side's usually just going to be a little bit shorter than the other side. When the gun's finished, you cannot tell that at all, but especially if it's a small amount. But even a small amount is going to skew your angle when you check it this way for the squareness of that line. So I just kind of eyeball several different ways through the cocking arm slot, in this case because it's a brake barrel gun, through the trigger block opening. Just eyeball, don't get too uh, crazy about this, but just uh, shim this one way or the other until it looks like it's pretty square. And then check that the line you drew is pretty square. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, these things are going to be invisible to the eye later, but... I just, you know, I like to say well, I do less than perfect if you're capable of perfection. Um, and when things are less than perfect in the process, they're going to be as minimally less than perfect as if you had not tried to be perfect at all. So, anyway, if that makes any sense. All right, so we got our line drawn. We've determined that we want the uh, recoil pad to be uh, flush with the top of the buttstock. Then I use an awl and poke through the screw hole and make a little scratch down there and then use the awl to make a divot uh, right on the center line where that was. Then I'm going to measure down uh, three and a six, actually before I make the divot, when it's a little mark, measure down the three and sixteenth inch, make its little mark, then I use the awl to open those up. Then I use those open holes to hand, to guide by hand, 
eighth inch drill bit and start those holes. But don't go too far because it's impossible to hold this square. Then I'm going to use a drill block. It's just a chunk of aluminum. It could be a chunk of uh, hardwood or you know really whatever with an eighth inch hole drilled through it on the milling machine or if you have a drill press so just so it's square. And I'm going to slip this on. I checked that and I used stainless steel screws to put the recoil pad on. So I checked and oh, actually did it this way. Um, checked and made sure that the drill bit's going to go through deep enough to accommodate the screw. And of course the recoil pad has some thickness, so that's that's going to be plenty. And I'm going to uh, place the drill bit in the hole that I started and then wiggle it around so that my drill block, block is square. And I'm going to punch that hole. Now I like to um, go in and out a few times to clear the wood dust out of the flutes of the drill bit. Again, put the block on the drill bit, put the drill bit in your starter hole, slide the block down to the wood, wiggle it around, make sure the block feels square. Nice. And I'm just going to do a, a last little bit, a little bit of clearing. Alrighty, that's that. So the next step is I'm going to soak this in finishing oil multiple, multiple times. Because it's end grain, it's going to suck it up like a sponge. And I'm just going to put a bunch in there. And then I'm going to use some grease on the screws. I'm going to use Super Lube. Vaseline works good too. You would just want to use something that's clear, not a colored grease, just something to lubricate it going in. And uh, Yeah, that's basically it. And then I'm also going to screw it in using a smooth shanked bit. Um, you know, most uh, Phillips driver bits um, have a hex feature all the way to the, to the point. But you see this one is smooth. So I, I don't want to put a, a hexagon shaped thing down through the rubber and maybe hog out the rubber hole. So I want to use a smooth sided. Now I'm going to use the uh, cordless drill to get it in until it's not quite snug and then I'm going to finish it by hand. Uh, I did once crack one of these uh, plates by letting it go in too tight. We want a little bit of squish to it but not so much it cracks. So. I'm going to accomplish those tasks and then I will check back with you when I'm on the belt sander ready to do the final shaping. Okay, here we are at the belt sander, going to shape the recoil pad. Let me show you. Can't see in the viewfinder very well. It's kind of bright out here at the opening of the shop, but I think you can kind of see it's on there and the wood and the rubber all have to be shaped. We're going to use uh, slack side sanding. Eyes, ears, nose, here we go.
So one thing I do when I'm doing this is I'm looking at the stream of material that's coming off the top of the work because that shows me where material is actually being removed. So you see uh, sawdust coming up off of here, then I know I'm removing material here. And so I can uh, manipulate this and watch that stream of dust coming off and know where it's being worked. I'm probably shouting because I have my ears on.
All right, this looks fantastic. Now that 80 grit belt, yeah, I should have mentioned I was using 80 grit belt. That uh, makes short work of the job, but uh, it certainly leaves lots of deep scratches that are going to be lots of work to remove. Um, they don't look so bad right now, but uh, when you start putting oil on it and getting down to the finishing stages, we actually still have a lot of work left to smooth out some of these curves, remove some of these rough grinding marks. But we are well on our way to a perfect, gorgeous, custom gunstock for the venerable HW30. It may be a lightweight, low-powered gun, but they're super accurate. They're just beautiful pieces of equipment, and they are entirely adequate. You know, really, all these guns, they're primarily intended for hunting, and seven or eight foot-pounds of an HW30 is perfectly fine for backyard collared dove, which is a non-native invasive species and quite tasty. So, this looks really nice. Um, so I got a lot more shaping to do. We got to shape uh, here. We got to shape the uh, the trigger guard opening down to the trigger guard. I already traced the shape of the trigger guard out inside there, so I can see where I got to do. I'm going to use a, the a drum sander on the gantry drill press to do this, and I'll check back with you when I'm doing something interesting. Thanks for watching everybody. Oh, I keep forgetting to remind you all to like, share, subscribe, or comment. All those things uh, help the Google algorithm, or YouTube algorithm, I guess it's all in the same house now. But, uh, yep, I, I have uh, almost 300 channels that I like to watch in a variety of different subjects. And as much as I want to support these people, I often forget to hit that thumbs up button. So, I like it when the YouTube creator reminds at the end of the video, like, share, subscribe, because I'm always like, oh yeah, of course, no big deal to me, and it helps the guy out. So do it for me. Thanks very much. We'll see you all soon.